on this episode of China Unscripted, China's cannibal capitalism, how they're sucking money out of the West, and their plan to take over with digital currency. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today is James Gorey, political economist and author of the book, The China Crisis. James, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. So, uh, you know, I think we're going to, we want to talk a lot about like, you know, the nuts and bolts of China's economy and how that affects the global economy. But so any discussion about China's economy, it always comes down to, you know, someone will say, well, China isn't actually communist. It's, it's, it's capitalism, really, or state capitalism or some other thing like that. So, you know, you're the expert. Why don't, why, what are your thoughts? Well, the problem with, with kind of nomenclature, it's what you, you know, what did Shakespeare say? Or a rose, but any other name is still a rose. Um, and, you know, so com- state capitalism is a, is a friendlier term than communism. But when you look at communism from a economic standpoint, it's the state owns everything, all the means of production. And there's usually a, uh, a necessity for political oppression, uh, social control, and all the, all the security apparatus that goes along with that. So, Anyway, after Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, um, there was um, there was tremendous amounts of control, um, but there was also tremendous amounts of poverty and and hunger. And communism, by definition, you know, when when the state owns everything, you you look into economic matrices that don't work because you're you're you're, you're controlling output without recognizing demand or <clears throat> different valuations of, of commodities or services within society. So it's very arbitrary, and by because it's very arbitrary, it's not very flexible. And you know, flexibility is is uh, in an economy is is key for adjusting to different conditions, market prices, market conditions, to, you know, all those kinds of things. So, yeah, now it's state capitalism, which was introduced in in the eighties, really, um, when they realized uh, the Communist Party in China realized that uh, they either start producing an economy that they promised um, or they uh, or there's not going to be there's going to be mass revolts which are happening so the, the economic term state capitalism or China's not communist they're certainly politically communist they're certainly socially communist they have the most advanced surveillance and, and political oppression apparatus probably since the Nazis or at least or maybe even the Stasi in Germany probably better actually much better in terms of technology so the economy is has been state capitalism. Now it's reverting back to mass state control. So they got wealthy. They had a strategy of of allowing and encouraging, you know, the West, whether it's the U.S., Europe, and, and Japan, from a market economy standpoint and technological development standpoint. And yeah, come on in, show us how to do it, build our factories, give us the IP, um, and then we're going to let let people loose. And that's the kind of the the contract they come up with after uh, Tiananmen Square, right? Don't talk politics. You go do your business, and um, we'll be responsible for the economy. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like it was this illusion of sort of opening up for the sake of the West. Like you know, even though you know there were privately owned companies, now uh, you know a lot of it was run by top party officials or people who were family or very closely tied to the party's elite. Uh, but it was just enough of this veneer that it drew in the West. And now we're inextricably tied to the Chinese economy, which, as you say, is, uh, you know, completely controlled by the Chinese state. Right. Uh, so- I'm I'm curious, James, you called um, you call it cap uh, cannibal capitalism yes. in your book. Why is that? Well, because <clears throat> uh, at the time I, it, it, in, when I wrote the book, I was kind of projecting. But but. The processes are all there. Cannibal capitalism is to, is the sense where the state or the, the economy feeds off of itself, and how that works is um, okay, so the state will dictate um, what happens, whether it's a, it's a new coal factory um, on a river, whether it's overuse and overfertilization of, of, of farmland, or any enterprise in the economy when the state. And the party has control over it or is able to snatch it away from the business owner once it's highly profitable. What happens? You don't create value. You 
you allow value to flourish and to be created, and then the state comes and takes it away. And the process there is you're destroying your factors of production. You're having a tremendous amount of waste in terms of producing commodities and goods. Um, at the time I wrote it, I think it was um, uh, China factors of production were 10 times the level that it took them to make the same product here in the U.S. So tremendous amounts of waste and corruption. Well, why is that? Well, because everyone has to be paid off. So cannibal capitalism is a using certain aspects of the, of the capitalist market, particularly outside capital, bringing capital in, um, creating and allowing businesses to flourish and then sucking the life out of them and destroying that value. And the mechanism there is what's called circular financing, which is simply just, you know, the value you take. So, so it's a, a state uh, or a party official says, hey, yeah, this is a great factory. Thank you very much. We're going to take it from you. It's too successful for you. You're getting too powerful. And we're going to see that later on as well. Um, so they would take over that factory, suck the money out, stick it in Geneva or Hong Kong or wherever, and then they'd get a loan from the People's Bank of China and refund, recapitalize it with borrowed money. And then the rates would be very favorable. But eventually, um, they'd get to be more value. They'd take more value out and then replace that value with another refinance. So it's a circular funding. And the bank's owned, you know, the PBC is owned by the, by the Chinese Communist Party. Chinese Communist Party is, is has membership, I don't know, 80, 100 million, whatever it is. And um, they have all those different aspects of how things are done. And it's very circular, right? Those three or four aspects are just very, very circular. And, and so you have these tremendous amounts of debt. And so th those things are just, they take, they suck the life out of it. I mean, think about how fast China grew without the state going over, you know, lowering it over them up to Tiananmen Square. That was the inflection point. And um, they had a they had a, a period there where there was rule by committee, so that it was relatively stable and no one had too much power and so forth. And that process just kept you know, getting worse and worse. And so, yeah, you're you're creating value and then you're destroying it and taking it out of the country. So in in so in layman terms, let me see if I understand this. It's it's like China's economy is built on like inflating a bubble. And then when that bubble starts to burst, you suck out all the value and put it into another bubble that then starts to grow until it starts to burst. And this process just kind of continues. Sure. I mean, look, at the, yeah, look at the recent example, which is kind of <clears throat> a tremendously great example because no longer are they taking multi-million dollar companies. Now they're taking multi-billion dollar companies. Jack Ma, Alibaba is a perfect example of that. Too big, too profitable, too powerful, too popular well, those are threats. Those are four different threats, right? Their ability to control the market, their actual revenue, um, their, their their depth of of market penetration, and the ability to influence who, you know what's bought and what's sold, and the popularity of the company and, and Jack Ma himself, right? All those things threaten the legitimacy, the power, the prestige, and the ability of the CCP. In particular, Xi Jinping to control the economy, to to maintain legitimacy, the facade of legitimacy. I think Alibaba is also interesting because it shows how uh, factional fighting within the Communist Party can end up screwing Western investors. Alibaba had lots of Western investors, but Jack Ma, his rise was thanks to uh, you know close ties to people tied to the political faction tied to former Chinese leader Jiang Zemin. Uh, I didn't say that super smoothly. Uh, and now Xi Jinping is going after the Jiang Zemin faction. And so that means Alibaba takes a hit. Yeah, Jiang's son was a big investor. Yeah. Right? And mm -hmm. yeah, so it's it, it's a problem. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the infighting is there, obviously. And what does the infighting mean? It means that there's a threat to Xi Jinping's power, ultimately, right? The infighting doesn't threaten the power of the CCP as as upfront and deliberately and obviously as it threatens the leadership of the CCP and Xi Jinping has made himself the apex, you know, primary leader of basically in every aspect of China and the economy, politics, social, foreign policy, military strategy, all, all of those things. He, he's, he's, the, he's the guy. He's the man. Um, so so on the one hand, you have a 
the party rife with infighting. Sure, absolutely. Um, the party has been described in, by many ex- experts and people very familiar with how it works as the mafia. It's mob. Ma. And um, that's probably not inaccurate. So Xi Jinping's a tough guy. No question about it. And um, he's going to do what he has to do uh, to uh, maintain that power. And whether it's internal fighting, internal party threats, or external ec- economic slash, you know, populist threats like Jack Ma. I mean, Jack Ma, you know, was, was if you if you looked at Chinese events, he'd be up there in some kind of wig and playing like a guitar, like he's like he's a rock star. And he had some bad karaoke. <laughs> Remember when he dressed up as Michael, Michael Jackson? Jackson? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what does that tell what does that tell the uh, leadership of the CCP? Hey, this guy is dressing up as a western degenerate rock star, getting with with the adulation of millions if not tens or hundreds of millions of Chinese. And what is he saying? What what is a concert like that or a presentation like that in some big rally? What does that tell the party leadership? We we've got it we've got to hammer this guy. We've got to knock him down because uh, there's only one superstar in China and Jack Ma is not it. It's Xi Jinping. Yeah. He should have dressed up like popular Chinese singer, Peng Liyuan. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very, very specific joke. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, yeah. So cannibal capitalism is basically, look, it's, it's, it's theft on a wholesale scale, state theft. Um, and I know some 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 folks who you know have made businesses in the U.S. and they get the business, they get the funding, they get uh, all of that kind of stuff from all that support from the CCP here in the U.S. So it, it's a it's a model that says, look, if you control the currency, you don't have to worry about its value, you control its external value relative to other currencies, but you can just shovel it off in, in bad debt and I think it's you know, off the shelf or um, in different ways, different creative accounting ways, then you, you're, you're controlling the, uh, you're controlling the economy without having to worry about that currency issue. You can put that off for a long time. You know, James, you were talking about what happened to Alibaba. What do you think about what happened to all of these Chinese tech companies, not just Alibaba in the last summer, education companies, uh, DD, all this stuff. Is that cannibal capitalism or is that something else going on? Where Xi Jinping was like the common prosperity thing, companies need to rein it in, et cetera. It is part of cannibal capitalism because why does cannibal capitalism exist? Why are they doing that? They, they have to if they want to maintain control. That's it. So whether it's Alibaba, whether it's these other companies, Tencent, whoever it might be, these big tech companies, they all, they're all threatening. Think about in a, in a, in a kind of a, a comparison in a way. It was the antitrust laws of the U.S. and then at the turn of the 19th century. These big corporations had um, tremendous amounts of power. They controlled the transportation of goods and services and people. Um, AT&T controlled the telematch. It was in the 20th century, obviously, but AT&T controlled communication. So um, the demo- you know, a democracy, a republic, a... a society that is not run um, from a, a dictatorship um, says, look, OK, we're going to destructure that so that you don't threaten our the freedoms of, of people and economic choice. So oligarchies are are bad for economies in the long term. They're great for the oligarchies, but they're bad for the economies. Um, China's gone the other way. The Communist Party is, is for all intents and purposes, just it's in the oligarchy business and it's in the control business. So this common prosperity, that's a veneer of saying we can't have two powerful you know, tech companies that control communications, that can influence the, the, um, the populace, right? How can, they, how can they countenance that? Um, so... And, the, and the, the corollary to that is the, the worse things get economically, the more they need to control the people. Hmm. Yeah, I think especially interesting about Tencent and Alibaba is that they were getting into the financial industry, right? Um, getting into basically you would have to use WeChat Pay or 
Alipay to pay things since China has become essentially cashless. And then they were getting into the debt uh, economy, like letting people borrow money. And that, I think, was a huge threat. In a way that had individual Chinese people kind of using money in a way outside of the direct control of China's central banks. Yeah. So I think that was a huge threat. you know, threat to the CCP too. The, the borrowing, yeah, the borrowing and the uh, sort of investment products where you could, the way to park your money would be to invest in essentially uh, the loans that these companies were making to people, right? So that sort of circular thing was happening, but within the control of WeChat and Alibaba. Which, how can, how can CCP really countenance that? How can they keep going and control the message, control who gets the message, control who they're financing, control the money. How, so it, it's really the, the issue underlying all of these things is control. So do you think in your experience, Western companies really understand what they're getting into when they try to get into the China market? They, they didn't. Um, when I wrote the book, of, you know, a number of years ago, they have now, a lot of them make that, decision right they make that kind of faustian bargain and it is a faustian bargain probably in every sense of the term um well gee my competitors are taking advantage of china's cheap labor and they're going to own the market they're going to undercut me in the market if i don't so do i want to go out of business tomorrow or do i want to have to deal with this china's taking my products my ip my tech my factories down the road somewhere. Well, you know, one is immediate in near term and one is mid to longer term. So there's that calculation being made, obviously. Um, today, companies are leaving. There's, you know, the reshoring trend, which started under Donald Trump, um, is, is picking up steam. And um, the supply chain disruptions from um, COVID-19 and from uh, uh, the tariffs that the Trump administration levied, but really COVID-19 um, really put the put a fine point on those disruptions. Companies saying, look, why, you know, the wage rate in China is much higher. We can build it cheaper in Vietnam or Malaysia or Thailand or in the European case in, in, in Turkey or in America's case in Mexico. And so there's a number of, companies, many companies that are reshoring and saying, look, we don't want to deal with the hassle of that and the political hassle and the and the theft of IP and the theft of technology and the theft of factories and those things. So all those are going on. It's happening. So to answer your question, sure, people knew what they were getting into, maybe not at the very beginning, but certainly um, certainly today. Now that they, they, they have a great, <laughs> a great idea of what's going on and, and they're trying to, to remedy it. So if 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 companies know what's going on, why do companies keep going in? And I I don't think it's really manufacturers anymore, but what we're seeing right now is like a bunch of financial uh, investment firms. Ray Dalio. Uh, well, yeah, Bridgewater opening a huge China fund, J.P. Morgan opening a mutual fund, Black Rock Black opening, Rock. Mm-hmm. yeah, it, like these investment funds in China. So they're obviously you know, putting their eggs in that basket. So why is that if other companies are pulling out, you know, more? Is it just an industry thing or why is that happening? Um, I think it's China realizes what they need. And so did China need financial reforms in 1989, 1990, 19, in the 90s? No, they didn't need it. What they do need, though, today is their financial system is, you know, on the teetering, on the brink of collapse. Um, there are lots of indicators of that, whether it's the whole restructuring of the, de- of the real estate property development uh, sector, uh, the shadow banking, financing economy on really bad, really horrible investments that are leaving people, you know, the average person bankrupt, whether it's the stock market uh, manipulations that go on where the, again, the party benefits, you know, all the pump and dump schemes and those kinds of things. So. They know China lets the West in where they need help. I mean, they're not they're not doing us a favor, are they? So what you're saying is, when China needed uh, manufacturing know-how, they 
let uh, American companies go in and set up factories and teach all the Chinese uh, workers and managers how to do that stuff so they could rip it off later. And now when they need finance, uh, cash and, and finance know-how, they're bringing in, you know, uh, Bridgewater and, and BlackRock and, you know, taking that money and taking that know-how. It's not just know-how, but it's risk management. Hmm. Well, what do you, well, what do you mean by that? This is only a, this is a recent development in the last year or so where, all right, we're going to let our com- let our open up our country to you and have, you know, 100% financial penetration, if you wish, in various contexts. Why is that? Well, China alone bears the risk, and we're seeing these risks um, come to, come to uh, flower in terms of the Evergrande and the financial, uh, the financial decisions and the financial investments behind them. China knows that. They, they, can, they can figure that out. They, they're smart people. They know exactly what's going on. So how do, we, how do we manage that risk? Well, we spread the risk. We spread the risk. And now we're going to, instead of having uh, <clears throat> our debt, our financial problems be ours alone, we're going to let all these, all these Western American companies come in with their money and let them take on the risk, some of the risk, and get some of the reward. But now it's not a China thing. Now it's a global thing. Now it's, a, now it's not just in China. It's spread around the world. Well, I feel like, you know, American investors are taking on a lot of risk without a whole lot of benefit. I mean, China's stock market has not really outpaced inflation in the last 10 years, whereas we're now putting huge amounts of like, you know, American pension funds and retirement funds and general investment. Like, you know, all, all of us in America are basically now financing this. We'd be better off putting our money into Dogecoin. <laughs> uh, I understand the stonks. Yeah, maybe so, but you, you might be right about that. But, you know, it's financial, you know, companies in, with, with, with resources and with, with long-term interest are saying, okay, well, maybe there is kind of a, uh, a bailout or a bail-up or a bail-in, whatever that verb is in China and maybe in the U.S. as well, where we're certainly getting our own uh, – building our own debt very rapidly and unprecedented. So it's not just in China, but so there's a, there's, there's gotta be an underlying assumption that the financial companies know what the risk is and that they also have a way through that risk, which may just be uh, leveraging, you know, the savings rate in China is what, 35, 37%. So it, it may well be just taking the money off of, <laughs> out of the savings, out of the, out of the common the common person savings and, and, uh, and for, through one through one uh, mechanism or another. I mean, I think a lot of Western investment companies have a perception uh, that investment in China is less risky simply because the Chinese government will bail them out. That was what uh, everyone, well, a lot of the experts were saying when Evergrande was beginning to collapse. They'll be like, oh, don't worry. It's the Communist Party will bail them out. No right, problem. Because, because they believe the party wants stability and therefore the party will direct the the government or the central bank to do the bailout. But will that apply to Western investors now? Well, I, one would have to assume that they, they think so. But – Yeah, they think so, but – What does is, what is history tell us? Uh, when China – when you every time a, a foreign company, an offshore – investment, direct investment, builds a factory, China automatically owns the majority of the factory, right? And they get the IP. And at some point, they take over the factory. So I don't think that, I don't think it's reasonable to assume that such a practice would not be done the same. I mean, yeah, again, these guys are smart guys. These are smart companies full of smart people. So they're trying to, they, they would have their hedge, they have their agreements, but, um, you know, it, I don't see China being the altruistic nation of let me just, you know, let us pay you back uh, if things go south. I think it's just a way of, of, of damaging. If, you know, let's put apples to apples, if the U.S. economy and the confidence in the stock market collapses, does that hurt China more? Or does it hurt America more? It hurts America more, right? So, I mean, the stock market's more than just a market. 
It's actually a foreign policy tool. Um, and that lets America, let, lets the U.S. create all kinds of opportunities for foreign leaders, get rich. You know, we're going to you know, central banks of other countries making money, et cetera. So it's, our, it's an actual foreign policy tool, not just a market. Um, and, and it's been tremendously influential around the world for the past 50, 60, 70 years or longer. So does the party really care that if, if 2 million or 1 million or whatever the number is in, in, in uh, Xinjiang or, or the Uyghurs are in prison, nah, they, they put them there. So there's that lack of, the, there's a certain self-interest that all nations have. Um, and China is certainly, and the CCP is certainly uh, uh, leveraging that and uh, focusing that. So I don't see, I don't see a, tip of, uh, a, a great ending here for the U S financial uh, industries that are moving over there, but that's maybe they know something we don't. I do find it telling that Evergrande keeps defaulting on their foreign bonds. <laughs> yeah. And repaying the domestic ones. Why is that? That would, uh, Chris, you said it a, a bit ago, stability. Uh, they have to have stability. They have to look like we're going to look out for you know it, it's that other right. This is the, the this is the the, the uh, manifestation of, of all the propaganda about all the anti U.S. propaganda that's been going on in China for decades. Well, we're going to protect you. We're not going to pay the, the the ugly Americans right or whoever may be holding the debt offshore. So you know there's there's that there's that. Excuse me. There's that historical kind of underlying current of, you know, foreign occupation, the century of humiliation, um, all those things which are, you know, in, in in the West, not even in the memory banks, but really. But um, the party has made use of that um, and, and kept that fresh in the minds of China for a long time, and paying off domestic bondholders and shafting the foreigners is. <laughs> it's okay, right? It's all good. Well, so on the topic of stability, the Communist Party wants it, but very obviously, the Chinese economy is a total mess. And people have been predicting for a long time it's going to collapse. Is it very obvious to people? See, if it's obvious to me, people, it should be obvious to other people. Should be. Well, I don't. what do you think, James? Is it obvious to people? It is to, to observers um, who understand the natures of economies, um, but, but I thought it would collapse before today. And what I've learned is that you can't underestimate the power of political and military social control. Look, China was very smart. They outsourced um, their banking or their, or their capital. Let's get the Western capital. Let's get the U.S. Let's get the Europe. They outsourced their technology and their IP. We don't have this stuff. We'll buy it from you. If we don't can't buy it, we'll steal it. If we can't buy it or steal it, we'll create you know these different programs, whether it's the Confucian Institute or a thousand these different thousand points of, of knowledge or whatever the, the the programs are to to recruit and pay you know top level scientists and, and microbiologists, whoever the, you know, whatever the vertical might be there, bring them to China, make them rich, and, and we get their and we, we get their their IP, we get their knowledge. So they've been very smart. You know, it's, it's interesting. Um, they didn't have this in 1989, but boy, they, they really made us, you know, 1990s, 2000s, and now we're in the third decade, uh, past the third decade, and they've done tremendously well. So they've outsourced a lot of what they needed, and we were happy to give it to them in one form or one fashion or another. Um, and that continues today, whether it's Huawei spyware or security spy, uh, spyware from different companies that funnel the information right back to China, right back to Beijing and, and the PLA. So um, stability is a big deal, but they've been smart about it because, look, what the Tiananmen Square showed, demonstrated, was that in a in a highly connected, highly communicative, and that was before the internet, actually, but highly communicatable world, the velocity of information is very fast. It has tremendous impact. Um, and the CCP figured out that we have to control that velocity. We have to control that flow. 
and stop it whenever we need to. So they have been doing that. And so the velocity of information and the exchange of information within a country is what generates innovation, right? So they, they stopped it at home largely and, and got it, got the information from the outside and then, you know, did their, did their best to, to leverage it internally and, and with specific targeted programs and universities and stuff like that. Like that. So you're right. Stability has been a big problem, been a big goal, um, but that it's kind of a yin and yang thing. If I can even use that term, it's because look, the more you have of one, the more you have of stability in terms of oppressing people, freedom of movement, lack of information, punishing innovative thought, um, all these types of things, then you create stagnation, which is what the Soviet Union did. And they saw that the China looked at Soviet and says, Oh, look at Glasnost. And, um, was it perestroika? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Perestroika. And they said, look what happens when they try to restructure and the free flow of information goes forward. And delegitimacy is the, is, is, is the result. And so um, the Chinese did a very, very smart thing. Um, we thought we were playing the China card against the Russians. Well, the Chinese were playing the American, the American card against hmm. America. That's, that's a good take. The worse things get, the more oppression to keep that stability going. Well, it's, in, it's interesting because you're making the point that like, because of the, you know, single-minded control over information in China, that basically has destroyed innovation. The Communist Party solved that problem by stealing innovation from abroad. Eventually, though, that's just going to destroy innovation globally. So then what happens? Well, I don't think it destroys innovation globally. Um, well, companies are run out of business. They're taken over by Chinese yeah. companies. They can no longer I mean, there's, function. There's less incentive to innovate if you feel like uh, you won't be able to control your IP. Yeah. That's right. true. Um, and that is part of the reshoring effort, part of um, uh, the tariff, um, you know, part of the fact that let's ban Huawei, which the U.S. did and tried to get Europe to do the same thing to some success. Um, the world is now waking up and look, let's be honest. Um, political leaders, there are some corrupt ones here and there. No <laughs> policy may not change as rapidly as it ought to, um, for perhaps partially that reason laws don't get passed because someone who has an interest or is owed or owes China something or however you want to convey that influence, um, those laws don't get passed or don't get implemented. I'm thinking Germany. Think of, sure. So at the same time, um, the fact is, is that the West is where innovation typically occurs. Not always, but West open societies where innovation occurs mostly. And, you know, Chris, if you're a young <clears throat> engineer and you figure out a way to, uh, I don't know, encrypt or compress uh, data in a way that is 10 times better than what we're doing now, you're going to have a market for it. Whether it goes to China, whether it's not in China, you, you know, it can go to the U.S. or so or, or other places. So the innovation is, is the hallmark of open societies. Unfortunately, the loss of that IP is also <laughs> the hallmark of, you know, not being able to keep it together. You know, an open society kind of is open. So you're going to have these opportunities and the Chinese have made full use of entrance in university and exchanges and bribery and theft and partnerships onshore and offshore and all those things. So, yeah, it's, it's, it, I don't think it stifles innovation worldwide, but I think it certainly does. Um, in a directed economy, they're more efficient at focusing money. Um, they're not so worried about, um, enforcing political correctness, for example, they don't care. So in some ways it's more efficient from a decisive made, but, but whether it's innovation, the process of innovation is not great, but look, Chinese are smart people. We're intelligent people. And, um, as all peoples are, they have the ability to look, they have hypersonic 
uh, missile delivery technology, nuclear weapon delivery. I don't think we have that yet. So whether they they invented it themselves or put it together through a variety of means of, of, of information acquisition, what matters is that they have it. And that's a that's a, a very important strategic advantage that uh, I don't think we've reconciled yet, at least not to put this up. As a nation, maybe at the top levels of the Pentagon, but I don't think it's in the it's in the social mindset here. It's interesting because I think what you're t- talking about with innovation, the Chinese Communist Party, I think they're going to try to command innovation. Uh, they're in their latest five year plan. Xi Jinping talked about the need to develop the Chinese semiconductor industry. Uh, specifically acknowledging essentially that um, the path that we had been talking about where they can take IP from uh, foreign companies is closing. So they need to advance their own semiconductor industry. I guess the question is, will they be able to do it? There was an interesting article recently uh, about how uh, several provinces had pumped a bunch of money into these semiconductor companies, supposedly, that didn't produce anything. Yeah. I mean, I like the idea of trying to command innovation, like innovate now. I mean, that's basically what the five year plan is saying. It's like we need to develop the semiconductor industry. And then that trickles down to provinces being like, oh, we need to develop the semiconductor industry and then funding a bunch of companies that say they can do it. And then nothing productive is coming out of that so far. Yeah. So there's an easy solution to that. And that is. China already has, from Beijing's standpoint, they already have a province that, that makes the world's best semiconductor right. chips. In fact, 50% of the world is dependent for AI and, and robotics and other advanced technologies are dependent upon this one company. It's in Taiwan. That is my favorite Chinese province. Mine too. Yeah, it's it's interesting how like a conversation about you know economics eventually like expands out into like even things like the invasion of Taiwan. It's all just tied together. It's, it's, it's not an invasion, Chris. It's, it's just, you know, bringing Taiwan province back into the fold. Uh-huh. Reunification. Uh-huh. Yeah. Reunification. But this is the important thing. Everything is very tied together now. So uh, how does what happens with China's economy affect the global economy? Well, uh, it- so there's a couple of different, as you might imagine, there's several different factors there. But let's suppose that China really, and China does. I wrote an article piece on this for the Epic Times a while back. You know, when Taiwan's uh, semiconductor manufacturing corporation, they're building plants. There's plants in Arizona and Japan. It's a strategic necessity that China be able to capture or have that capacity not a want it's a it's a need um because if you don't have that then they're subject to uh boycotts and other things right so um so taiwan how does how does their failing economy affect things well it's going to force them in one sense it's going to you know encourage them or and give uh you know cover diplomatic cover economic cover whatever you want to call political cover to to go to taiwan and say look we're we're taking you we're taking your factory and and there have been papers and articles recently saying well taiwan should have a a self-destruct method mode on their plants right so that they they are invaded off the the, the chip making process um goes with it um which is not a bad idea actually but um so it it, but the worst things are internally whether it's the over pollution of the the lakes, the water sources, the farmland, the rampant desertification, um, all of these things draw in the resources, whether it's um, you know, forest for their some of their industries, like the furniture making industry, or whether it's oil, whatever it is, that's pushing China outward. It has been for 25, 30 years. Um, so, and, and they've been very smart. Again, uh, they've been very smart about it. They, they looked at what Great Britain did as an empire uh, 200 years ago or so. And what they did was very clever. Britain figured out that, look, if we control the sea gates in the world, then we control commerce in the world at that time. And, you know, military uh, power, the, the projection of military power with, via a navy. 
So it's it's no accident or coincidence that you know the War of the Falkland Islands that was a sea gate for the, for the Horn of South America, right? The tip that was you, you controlled access. Uh, Gibraltar is another one in Spain. Why does why is Britain there? You know, Panama is the U.S. took that role in Panama. Now China is owns the you know, controls ports in Panama and um, all over the world. I mean, the entire One Belt, One Road is basically about controlling, right, all the shipping ports and right. so, train stations. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in that regard, the, the policy of using the rest of the world to support Chinese Communist Party rule in China and elsewhere as it, as it expands, that's driving, that's enabling them to do that. And the worse things become in China, the more driven they will be to have foreign adventures. Hmm. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that you were talking about the South China Sea in 2012 when a lot of the militarization hadn't quite happened yet to the degree that it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, well, <clears throat> you start with the steps that you can take easily. You get, you get quick, you know, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, right? The easy victories. And that um, who's going to stop you? Because at that point in time, it was – you know, the Beijing model and, and China, the, the flow of capital and innovation and, and, and investment in the China was, was enormous. So who's going who's gonna to blow the whistle? Who's going to throw up a red flag or, you know, uh, complain about what China's doing in the South China Sea? Right? That, it, it, was, it was a fly in the ointment. Well, there's a lot of ointment. People ignored the fly. And uh, so China got a very big piece. Um, they did something that they could uh, easily do. It's, it's, it's nearby, and um, it set a precedent. So now those those islands have been around for a decade or so, and and there are uh, uh, much more. They're, they're a, a jumping off point for the rest of Asia, the rest of the Pacific. I think what's interesting about this analysis is. You know, people talk about like, you know, if China's economy collapses, it'll damage the global economy. But this is an interesting take that it's actually mode like it's motivating the Chinese Communist Party to become more expansionist, to have even more power and influence globally. Well, it is. But let's not leave the <clears throat> cultural aspects out of it. Right. As I mentioned earlier, um, when you're pumping out propaganda, anti-Western propaganda, specifically anti-American propaganda, and 24-7 in the, in, the, in the official channels, whether it's radio, TV, newspaper, whatever it might be, billboards even, um, you, you're creating it. Now you have two generations, right, that have this kind of baseline understanding of, of the world, and that baseline understanding is that it's China versus the, versus the West. It's China's been held down. China's been um, abused, disrespected, uh, lost face um, in the uh, centuries leading up to uh, the 21st century. And that's not entirely untrue. So there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's that argument. We're getting our, our back. We're getting our vengeance. We're getting what's justly ours. We're taking back our history. We're taking back our, you know, China's a great country. We're the most populous country in the world. We're one of the oldest civilizations in the world. Why aren't we, we should be ruling the world. We should be, why should a nation of 350 or 400 million people have such an outsized impact on the world and control? Of so there's a lot of, there's a lot of that cultural, psychological, historical kind of narrative that is, that, that makes, make people think, yeah. Why not? You know? So. Well, I think it's important to point out that that narrative is one that was, cr- you know, created by the Communist Party and taught to everyone in China from kindergarten on up. Yeah. Yeah. And the party is using that to, you know, essentially push for their plan of global domination. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, you know, the U.S. economy is so strong, particularly the U.S. dollar. How can the Chinese Communist Party possibly replace those things? Well, that's, um, <clears throat> you know, nothing is done by accident. Um, it's planned. 
So the economy is planned. Um, the Olympics are planned. Now, what, what, what does China hope to get out of the Olympics? What did they get out of the, was it 2008 Olympics, some Olympics? And yeah. Yeah. They got a lot out of that. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, they did. Um, what's China going to introduce in the coming games in February? They're going to introduce the digital yuan. Got the whole world coming. Yeah. So there's, there's two things are going to be given to the world in, 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 in February. Probably the latest dose of COVID and the digital yuan. So China wants to lead the nation, lead the world, and they are. We're going to introduce the first national digital currency. And it, it, it's going to facilitate trade much better, much quicker, much cheaper in terms of uh, currencies, uh, exchanges, and all the types of things. And it also provides obviously, a lot more control. They want to make the Chinese yuan compatible or competitive um, and, and preferred over the U.S. dollar, of course. And that's one way of doing it. Can they make it more powerful and more appealing than Dogecoin? <laughs> um, I have a, I'm, I have to ask myself, I'm sure you have as well. What, what's the end game, if there is one, for digital currency? And digital currency... The original, uh, the original appeal was was non-inflationary, you know, freedom and anonymity, right? So um, people could bargain and trade as they wish without having to worry about exchange rates and fluctuation rates and currency controls, capital controls, inflationary issues from central banks and so forth. Um, so you had anonymity, you had speed, you had trans, uh, you had uh, all these different advantages that just didn't that uh, made it so, oh, you know, drug, drug dealers, the dark web, those people like that stuff, but like those advantages. But the reality is, is that, yeah, it threatens national sovereignty around the world. And so I don't see a world that uh, an, a group of nations that are going to let parallel currencies exist in the long term. I know that's kind of a pessimistic view, but I think it's you either control your currency or you don't. And if you can't control your currency because people are using these other, op these other options and you can't tax it, you can't trace it, you can't stop it, you can't levy against it, I mean, and, and it's driving the value and desirability of your currency downward, then there's a lot of problems there. So what do you, what do you as a country, if you're China, if you're the U.S., if you're Russia, if you're especially the authoritarian nations, what are you going to do? You're going to create. You're, you're going to ban it. You're going to try to ban it. Yeah, and, and create your own version. You're going to create your, that you control. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I, I've always believed that it's important to have a stable currency. And by stable, I mean a currency where the government gradually and arbitrarily sucks value out of that currency so people lose more and more of their capital. Uh, and uh, that's what China is going to do with its digital uh, RMB. Is exactly that, right? They can they have an easy mechanism to adjust the value of the money that everyone else holds, and they call that stability. It sounds like inflation. No, Chris, it's stability. It's it's also a tremendous um, asset addition to the to the social credit policy. Us having this conversation would would have our digital dollar accounts frozen, right? Or our digital yuan accounts, I suppose. So. Um, sorry, you can't buy anything because uh, you've, we just heard what you talked about. And so your digital currency, which is the only currency that's available, let's say, in, a, in, in some time in the future, then uh, you're fined automatically. No, you know, no court. You just you just lose some of your digital you want, some of your digital currency. So, In some ways, it reminds me of how, like, impossible it is to appeal to YouTube, Whenever they demonetize us or age restrict YouTube. us, thank yeah. you, YouTube. And so, if if China controls the global currency, and like you know, it doesn't matter where you are, if they control the money, they control they, they you. They literally demonetize you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes. New new meaning to that. I always, you know, China's been buying and creating a lot of gold for the past couple of decades. You know, maybe there's this partial gold standard, right? Use the digital one, we have some gold. Yeah. Well, I mean, they can they can claim they're going to be on a gold standard, but you know the the problem with the gold standard, if it, any country that follows the gold standard is now beholden to the amount of gold that they have in reserve, unless they're cheating, which perhaps many countries did in the past and 
perhaps that's one reason why we're no longer on the gold standard because it's too hard to maintain that. But like, why would, if people accept a fiat currency, I mean, why would China even want that? If they just would want the gold so that they can have leverage over other countries. Yeah, it would be a country, it would be a national policy. It wouldn't be at the personal level. It would be, all right, we're going to adopt the one you want and, and there will be certain gold window privileges for national for net, you know, it may be digital dollar, digital yuan, digital ruble, and there are certain gold IMF structured or the Chinese equivalent structured ways of having gold windows be uh, um, created, accommodated, and so forth. But yeah, for for the average Joe and Jane, no, it's just it has nothing to do with gold. You know, it has to do with power. So um, yeah, I don't see I don't see this digital currency being the wave of the future for so much longer in, in terms of the anonymity, in terms of the freedom, in terms of the lack of control. So uh, I see it much more along the lines of, hey, adopt the digital yuan. You're going to get better pricing, better service. You know, your teeth will be whiter. I mean, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds so convenient. It does. Well, we're already there, right? How many people go to Starbucks and just flash their phone and that's it? Anyone who goes to Starbucks deserves whatever they get coming into them. I can't argue that. Yeah. Well, so I think in this conversation, you know, we're kind of talking a lot about big picture things. And the big gap, I think, is that individual Americans don't really realize how invested they are personally in China. So how much how much exposure does just your average American have to China? How does it affect them? It's, it's really... It's hard to put a, a percentage on it, but you can say, well, tremendous amounts of fraudulence in the stock market or leverage or connectivity to fraudulent companies in the stock market. So your, your 401k, your IRA, your investment account, you own mutual funds, and some of those funds are international funds, uh, and they're going to own what they think are relatively good companies, but behind those companies are other fraudulent companies or the numbers aren't real. Um, or they can be cratered if they wish to be um, by China. So, that you, you know, it's a, it's a weak link kind of thing, right? It's kind of like Django, right? They pull out, you think that's a real piece, but not, but it's not there anymore. It's, it's the numbers are fake. The, the, so on the stock market, that's a big deal. Um, in terms of our manufacturing base, that's another big deal, right? We are dependent upon um, China for all kinds of things. For all kinds of products and services that that actually fuel the economy, and uh, so, and they're still they, they still want to capture more market share in terms of capital equipment for large businesses, small and medium sized enterprises, um, and they want to capture financial products and so forth, um, financial services, accounting, and I know it sounds weird, but they they do want to do that because they see look it's just picture the Amazon. Uh, for example, Amazon does all these stuff, and they were really linked to China heavily. Now, picture uh, you know, the American economy, the small businesses which create you know seventy percent of, of, of the jobs, and they're reliant on on equipment from China. So, any disruption there, it's a it's a problem. Supply chains, we're seeing that now, and uh, the more they lock down COVID, the more that happens. And that's not the only reason, but it's a big one. Do you think COVID has changed anything as far as America's exposure to risk from the Chinese economy? Our perception or reality, are you asking? Both, but I'm curious about the reality of the situation. It's an interesting phenomena that you have you know, supply chains disrupted, and yet the onus is not – we're not creating all these small business – funding opportunities we're, we're we are i mean we're people larger businesses are benefiting from from covid payouts and so forth but small businesses are not so is that a, is that accidental is that incidental um it just seems rather <clears throat> kind of like a it's the trend of com- countries that power is being centralized that's how i look at it and one of the ways to centralize power is to make people dependent. Well, how do you make them dependent? You take away their means of livelihood. 
Um, now, obviously, you have to have uh, industry and, and, and you know, supplies and so forth, but um, it seems to have inordinately affected the small business owner. So I don't. I, I think that COVID has pr- provided a a a method or an excuse or a reason or rationale to to kind of hollow out to a certain extent the small business community in America. Um, so we'll see what kind of recovery we have, but it, we're certainly less healthy than we, we were two years ago. Well, maybe in the future, a really centralized American corporation and government can work with the centralized authorities of Beijing to create just kind of a global centralized government, one world government. Yeah. Why are you giving me that look, Shelley? Do you want to get this demonetized and age restricted by YouTube? That feels like that's what you're doing right now. No, I think you just I don't mean, know. imagine. I think that I could. I was hearing the the piano play and, and John Lennon singing. We're all, you know, a brotherhood of man. That's kind of where it's going, right? So great. He, he he himself described that as basically the Communist Manifesto, the song Imagine. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm sure it'll be equally as wonderful as he describes it. Yeah. I, I had the impression he was kind of surprised how schlocky, like the, of the kind of schlocky use of it all the time. That yeah, he didn't like, really like it. It's, it's amazing how people don't listen to the lyrics. Like, imagine no religion. Okay. What, what does that mean? Am I going to be forced to give up my beliefs? Yeah. Come on. Possession, no possessions. Where are my possessions going? Come on. And yet it's, it's such a, it's a, it's an anthem of kind of the, it, it could be an anthem for the CCP really, right? It could be an anthem for kind of the far left in this country or any country for that matter, I guess. It's, it has a strange hypnotic power over some people, I'm afraid. So in terms of, you know, we talked about the effect that COVID is having in the U.S., um, what is the effect that it is having on China's economy? Well, they're, they're locking down a lot. Um, I, I think it's used as an excuse that um, because they're doing things horrendously, right? They're, shutting apartment buildings, people can't leave. And you, it looks to me, if I just step back and think, okay, well, what's the end result here? So they're getting rid of powerful billionaires and tech companies, not getting rid of them, they're just absorbing them. So they're becoming state-owned, right? So it looks like just across the board, across the economic spectrum, the state is using whatever it can. The notion of common prosperity, that kind of policy, that, that really means getting rid of anyone who's rich is not the party. Or anyone in the party we don't like. Um, so it's it's common prosperity. It's using class warfare to justify, you know, theft on a massive scale. Um, the common prosperity, well, you, we've got to lock you down so to protect everybody. So what's not happening is, you know, that's hurting their economy. They're, they're not producing as much. Um, and there's less to spend on. So people are saving more and they're, they're saving more because they're not very optimistic. And that savings will be, I'm sure, absorbed in some one fashion or another, as we talked about earlier. So it's creating this grand kind of health crisis and um, kind of upswing in control and centralization of power. That's the deal. And so, uh, again, they're going to, you know, when things go, it's, it's the old saying, right? When things go, or things are rotten at home, <laughs> go, go, to, go somewhere else and, and see if you can make things better. Well, that typically means um, you know, starting a war or foreign adventures or whatever it might be. So I don't see things as, um, you know, I don't see COVID as an isolated event. I think it's uh, part and parcel of a larger well, so perhaps to wrap up the conversation today, how can uh, both America as a country and individual Americans protect themselves, you know, get themselves in a situation where the Chinese Communist Party is not going to succeed in their expansionist ambitions? Gosh, uh, that's a big question. Uh, 
you know, at the macro level, I think it has to be, and you're seeing some of this, um, not just in America, but in Europe as well. You know, the West is seeing China as a more and more moving from competitor to adversary. And so this latest, you know, these, these revelations about, you know, sending encrypted data, you know, listening on in your, uh, whether it's security or phones or, or you know, uh, computerized data that's going back to China. They're seeing that. A, a, that's now a reality. Now, how they, how, how the U.S. or the European Union reacts, the reaction seems to be trending towards much more adversarial than, you know, well, gee, well, perhaps our present, our present administration accepted. Um, that's the exception. But um, as for individuals, you know, it's. America is, was built on small innovation, right? Small level, small business innovation. And, and so I would say, you know, it's, it's, it's all about buying local. It's all about investing in local companies. It's investing in your community or your, your local area that, that, you know, provides the capital, provides the market for, uh, that keeps, you know, keeps the dollars here, keeps the investments here and, uh, not buying things that are made, uh, you know, by slave labor in, in some far off Chinese province is, is a good start. Um, unfortunately, as you all know, and as everyone knows, is the drivers of our economy, um, at least at the high level, are, are is the corporations and Hollywood. And um, I'm thinking of that Ricky Gervais quote. You know, well, you say you're woke, but uh, everything you make is uh, in sweat created by slave labor in, in Chinese sweatshops. So. You know, that was brilliant. Uh, it was a couple of years ago at the Golden Globe. But I, I think we have to go local. We have to do as much as we can by American. I know it sounds kind of hokey, but it's it's, it's true. Um, and uh, be aware of what you're buying, what you're not buying. Uh, at the, at the, and support, your, support your, your neighbors and your communities and their businesses while you can, I guess. While you can. That is, that is definitely the message. Do do it now, or else it won't. You won't be able to do it in the future. Seems that way. I think that's very important. Be trending that way. Yeah. Sure does. All right, James. Thank you so much for joining us today. That was that was very interesting. Uh, for anyone uh, listening or watching, where can they go to follow more of your work? Uh, I write for the Epic Times. I sometimes blog on my blog, The Banana Republican, when I have time. Um, the band republican.com but I, I'm on the epic times and you can you can uh, access the epic times anywhere as well epic times.com all right so thanks so much for having me I really enjoyed it yeah thanks thanks for joining us it was great thank you you know his whole thing about buying American made me think of something I saw on Twitter the other day which is the you know Everybody is talking about, because of Omicron, cloth masks aren't useful. You should be getting an N95 mask or mm -hmm. something like that. And someone had posted a photo of Nancy Pelosi's office had given uh, congressional staff uh, free N95 masks. Someone posted a photo of it. It was made in China. Uh. It wasn't an N95. It was a KN95 mask that was made in China. And I was just thinking... You know, how many of these masks that we're all going to be going out and buying now or everybody's being encouraged to go out and buy are made in China? Uh, and when we talked to that guy from Prestige, Prestige Ameritech, Ameritech, the American company that's trying to manufacture masks in the U.S., and he was talking about how essentially uh, his company had all been almost bankrupted several times by cheap imports from China and how they're trying to just flood the market again in the middle of the pandemic with cheap Chinese masks that American companies, and there are a lot of American companies that have been founded during the pandemic to essentially make surgical masks and N95 masks when we had a shortage because China completely shut down production to the rest of the world. And now those companies are being bankrupted by these Chinese companies that are flooding the market. And then Congress is buying Chinese made N95 masks. Yeah, you can forgive them. They're all, what, the median age in the Senate is 65? They're old. They're out of touch. They don't know any better. The people running our country. Doesn't just, that make you feel good? I mean, it's just, it's so aggravating because there are American companies that are doing this. Like, yeah. Yeah. I know, but it costs slightly more to buy American. 
Yeah, I've used the ch Chinese surgical mask before too. Somebody gave me one that was one made in China. I always try to buy masks made in the U.S. But but you bought a bunch of Korean ones too, right? Yeah, so I try to buy things that are not made in China. The kind of mask I was buying wasn't being manufactured by American companies at the time, but hope now they are. But now we could all get American ones. Yeah, yeah. they they are now making like KN95, KF94 style masks in the U.S. But uh, the Chinese surgical masks, like the plastic part, it didn't even really work because there's a, like a nose piece that you're supposed to be able to like kind of fold over. Yeah. It wouldn't stay down. So it was kind of useless in terms of actually like keeping a seal around your face. Wonderful. So not only did Pelosi hand out Chinese made masks, they were also probably ineffective. Well, I don't know about those ones. Well, but the FDA has. Uh, over the last couple of years, revoked a bunch of emergency use authorizations to these Chinese mask companies because oh, they good. found out that the masks weren't providing the level of protection they claimed that they were. There were also problems of counterfeit ones. And there yeah. were some some of them that were uh, unsanitary. Yeah. So, you know, there's been a bunch of problems, but yeah. yet here we are. Well, so this is why figuring out how to buy things that are not made in China is so important. And- we, we are working on we that. We are working on it. Yeah, we are working on a channel to help people find out how to buy things that are not made in China. Uh, you know, we're going to be doing things like product reviews of things that are not made in China. If you need to find a microwave or you need to find, I don't know, what other things, you need to find a pen that's not made in China. Well, even masks now. Like yeah, to masks make it, that are not works. made in China. You know, we can help you do that. So we're, we're working on launching that channel this year. Yeah. Yeah, this is something we're pretty passionate about, which is why, you know, we have our merchandise store, chinancensored.tv slash merchandise. Uh, it was very difficult for us to set it up because we had to find a vendor who would not have mugs made in China, T-shirts made in China. It, it took us a lot of extra time and effort to find a vendor who would do that. And it certainly cuts into our profit. I but... mean, with the mugs, we also, it was hard to find, like we had to buy all the mugs ourselves, essentially. Yeah, yeah. So we we had to make some sacrifices for it, but this is what we're passionate about. So hopefully it'll become easier as time goes on to find things that are not made yeah. in China. Well, especially when we get the show going sometime this year. Early this year? Early let's, this let's, year. Let's see what we can do. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is also why, you know, what you guys are doing to support us on China Uncensored and, and you know, our, our Patreon. We also have a Patreon for China Unscripted. Uh, it's helping us not only do these shows, but also to launch new shows that you guys are going to be interested in. Yep. So, yeah, that was good cross promotion there. I like yeah. that. Uh, all right. Well, I think that wraps it up for today. So thank you for watching this episode of China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesda. And we'll see you next time.